Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, third of a wonderful series of Locke lectures uh, given by Professor Coburn and Mercer. And uh, I just want to welcome you all and thank you for joining us. Uh, we also want to thank uh, Dr. Marcelina Morgan. She is going to introduce uh, Kovina tonight, and she's just returned here from Egypt, so straight off the plane, we whipped her into this uh, wonderful intellectual moment. And um, I just want to thank you all again for joining us, and then we will see you soon at the next set of lectures. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. It's a true honor to be here to introduce uh, I, you know, as long as I've known Kobina, I always say his name wrong and right and wrong and right. So I apologize in, in advance. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure. I've known um, Kobina Mercer since um, the mid-90s. And there, I just want everyone here to know that as we meet along the way, um, thinking that we're just doing our work, we're also building incredible friendships. And we'll, you know, thankfully, um, and it's, a, it's joyous to see people throughout um, our entire lives. And so it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm delighted to welcome you this afternoon to the third of Kobina Mercer's um, Alain Leroy Locke Lectures. This series was established to bring to Harvard a distinguished person and innovator in the field of African American culture and history to deliver a series of three lectures. Based on Kavina Mercer's rich and innovative body of work, it's hard to imagine a better fit for this lecture series. And according to everything, and unfortunately I, I have been away and haven't been able to hear uh, the lectures, but I've certainly heard a lot about them. It's been an incredible, incredible uh, uh, previous two lectures on Robert Scott Duncanson and Edmonia Lewis. And the, these lectures simply add to the notion of um, um, the, the importance of the Locke lectures in terms of the innovation and the ideas that, that we're really trying to look at here. For those of you who aren't present, um, he, um, Kabina, uh, I just want to give him a little more background once again. And uh, he's a writer and critic who lives outside of London, he earned his undergraduate degree <coughs> in painting and a PhD in sociology an indication of the innovative and textured path he takes into art and the history of art. He's the editor of Pop Art and Vernacular Cultures, Cosmopolitan Modernisms, and Discrepant Abstractions, published by MIT Press, and author of Welcome to the Jungle, New Positions in Black Cultural Studies. His writing ha has appeared in several anthologies, including Out There, um, Black British Cultural Studies, Art and Its Histories, France Fanon, Critical Perspectives, Without Guarantees in Honor of Stuart Hall, and Theorizing Diaspora. And he's written monographs on artists including James Van Der Zee, Adrian Piper, Isaac Julian, Keith Piper, and Rotimi Fane Coyote. Uh, Coyote. We heard from David Binman yesterday that Dr. Mercer is a key contributor to the fifth volume of the images the image of the black and Western art, the monumental series uh, uh, calling um, P Professor ben, uh, Binman is editing here at the Du Bois Institute. I first met Kobina Mercer in 1992 when we were both at the Humanities Research Institute in Irvine, California. And I got to know him better when he was visiting at UCLA and we both lived in Venice, California. All of my colleagues were influenced by his analyses, his daring, um, and his new and creative interpretations. Um, we would comment at how surprised we were that he might actually like us, since he seemed much more serious than we could manage to be most of the time. Um, yes, he sent us running many times to the dictionary. Uh, uh, on several occasions, and we loved every second of it, and would argue with each other about who looked and who didn't look, and you know things like that. Um, it was great because it was a fantastic group. Um, I really got a sense of who he is as both an intellectual, as a person, as a friend. Uh, when I was in Jamaica and having just uh, uh, doing research there and having conversation with an old friend named Gerlin Bing. And she said, without me mentioning his name, she wondered what happened to him 
uh, when he was a teenager working in a bookstore in London, black bookstore where revolution was really possible. She said he was serious, reliable, and lovely. He's the inaugural recipient of the 2006 Clark Prize for Excellence in Arts Writing, presented by the Sterling and Francine Clark Art Institute. He's taught at NYU, UC Santa Cruz, UCLA, Princeton, Middlesex University, and has had fellowships from Cornell University New School um, in New York. Today, Dr. Mercer will close out his Locke Lecture Series with recrossings, three 19th century black Atlantic artists with his talk, The Journey Home, Henry Osawa Tanner. Please join me in warmly welcoming Kobina Mercer to Harvard University this afternoon. Good afternoon. First of all, I'd like to um, express my heartfelt thanks to Marcelina uh, it truly is heartwarming seeing old friends again, and even though I can't quite believe the passage of time myself, it's, um, it's somewhat reassuring, really, um, as well as the diasporic dimension as well. Um, it's been so long since uh, I'd seen Gerlin Bean. That really, really does take me back. Um, also, just to acknowledge that um, I really want to say that your questions, observations, and even corrections over the last couple of days have been immensely valuable. Uh, that's, as it were, the most dialogic aspect of the, of, of the process, uh, but really incredibly important, I think, to that ongoing process of looking again, rereading, rethinking, revising. Uh, also to say that the three-part format of the Elaine Locke lecture series um, has really been a case of serendipity. When I was working on this, I was thinking of focusing on these three 19th century artists um, all in one chapter. This was not only completely unwieldy in terms of a bulky chapter uh, in which one wouldn't possibly be able to give each artist the attention they deserve, uh, but raised a whole number of methodological problems about uh, the survey genre. So I'm, I'm really delighted that there's the prospect of publishing these talks at a future date, uh, and the three-part format works incredibly well. And the final thing I'd like to say um, is that one thing I've noticed over the last 10 years is the emergence of a new generation of scholars in art history. This certainly wasn't the case when I started out. And it's incredibly exciting, the new perspectives, the new voices and questions being raised, uh, not only by African-American scholars in art history, but also those from Caribbean, black British, and black European contexts as well. I've met people in Germany uh, who are doing really exciting work. So even though art history has been saddled with a rather stuffy, uh, conservative uh, reputation, uh, I think we have to watch this space because I think over the next 10, 15 years, we're going to be seeing an incredible, incredibly exciting range of publications. Okay, onward to today's talk. Okay, on the face of it, the Black Atlantic model seems less readily applicable in the case of Henry Osawa Tanner. Not only was his emigration final, but Tanner himself framed his choice of expatriation in more or less assimilative terms. Settling in Paris at the age of 35, he reflected on his adopted country of France in the following way. Um, this is from a 1908 article, quote, there is a breadth, a generosity, an obsolete cosmopolitanism about her recognition of the fine arts, which bars no nationality, no race, no school, or variation of artistic method. All she asks is that art shall be true. In other words, that it shall set forth life. Tanner had studied at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia from 1879 to 1884 as the first African-American to enter the profession through studio-based training. His father, the Reverend Benjamin Tucker Tanner, who held a leadership role in the Philadelphia headquarters of the AME Church, supported his choice of career only reluctantly, and Tanner's early work as an illustrator and as a landscape painter traveling through Florida, North Carolina, and Atlantic City during the 1880s 
indicates his circuitous quest to secure a place within the art market. Following his attempt to run a photography gallery in Atlanta, Tanner served as an art instructor at Clark University and with the support of Bishop Joseph Crane Hartzell, who was a Clark trustee who purchased the entire contents of Tanner's first one-person exhibition that was held in Cincinnati in 1890, he was able to finance his initial voyage to Europe in 1891. Headed for Rome, Tanner decided to stay in Paris and he enrolled at the Academy Julienne. And although Tanner returned to Philadelphia to convalesce from typhoid fever in 1893, he then settled permanently in France as an expatriate in late 1894. Beginning with Daniel in the lion's den, um, this is the uh, second version, uh, an earlier one was from 1895. The biblical narratives that he chose as his primary subject resulted in works that received official recognition. The Resurrection of Lazarus of 1897 won a third class medal at the Paris Salon and was then purchased by the state for display in its Musée de Luxembourg. And only two other American artists, John Singer Sargent and James Whistler, had received this distinction, which Tanner himself found out about during his return from a sketching tour of Cairo, Jerusalem, and Jericho. Creating a body of work that's characterized by painterly attention to atmospheric qualities of color and light, and absorbing, absorbing post-impressionist and symbolist influences in compositions that are informed by a commitment to direct observation, Tanner was resident in France up to his death in 1937. And having secured a place among the art establishment, for he had been elected to the Legion of Honor by the French government in 1923, one could say that he was far removed from the domestic politics of race in the United States. And yet there is a paradox that links Tanner to his African-American precursors. Enjoying an unprecedented degree of artistic autonomy, it is significant that for the most part, Tanner actively chose not to depict black subjects. The scarcity of black content in his herb thus maintains a numerical ratio that is consistent with that of Lewis and Duncanson, even though the social and political conditions surrounding the late 19th century era of reconstruction had lifted some of the extreme ideological pressures that had dictated the need for semantic indirection in earlier periods. So whereas religious iconography had accommodated a political subtext, as we saw in the case of Lewis's Hagar, for instance, just as classical landscape sheltered a counter discourse of allegory in Duncanson's work, Tanner's chosen source of inspiration in the Book of Gospels was straightforwardly motivated by his spiritual beliefs. As he explained in 1913, quote, it is not by accident that I've chosen to be a religious painter. I choose religious subjects, not primarily because I believe they will interest the people, nor because I consider them to be the most saleable. I have chosen the character of my art because it conveys my message of interpreting through my brush the holiest and greatest theme that belongs to the literature and hope of the world." End quote. However, I think it's interesting to observe that even in this regard, it's important to note that the religious themes that Tanner chose often resonated deeply with the Afro-Christian tradition of diasporic exegesis. A case in point is the fact that the Exodus narrative of the Israelites, Israelites flight into Egypt was painted by Tanner no less than 15 times. So taking account of his complex attitude towards issues of race, our focus here lies in two genre paintings that he produced during his mid 90s, um, yeah, mid 1890s sojourn in the United States. That is to say the banjo lesson of 1893 and the thankful poor. These works call for in-depth attention on account of their status as the first realist paintings in American art to portray the inner world of black family life as a subject of serious artistic contemplation. And also because it was precisely the boundary between public and private spheres that was given political significance by the competing views on reconstruction put forward by such emergent intellectuals as W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. <laughs> 
In the context of their retrospective assessment of the 30 years since emancipation, education was of utmost concern on all sides. Access to higher learning was a driving factor in the growth of black colleges during this period, in which the AME played a leading role. And in addition to formal education, the informal education provided, by the process, uh, provided in the process of character formation, carried out in families and communities, was paramount to the nascent politics of accommodationism on the one hand and nationalism on the other, that each proposed competing goals for black achievement and for the direction of black progress. Rather than making a direct intervention in these debates, Tanner sheds light on the dividing lines of reconstruction as a formative moment when post-emancipation identities come into being as a result of a struggle over the re-accentuation of available signifiers in the discourse of race. Now, by focusing on the artist's personality rather than the semiotic agency of his art, previous studies tend to opt for a biographical approach that attributes Tanner's emigration and the paucity of black images in his work to his individual temperament alone. The portrait produced by Thomas Eakins of his former student in 1902 is often taken as a key point of reference on this approach. Seen with his eyes averted from the viewer's gaze, it conveys Tanner's introspective attitude, even as Eakins evokes a sense of parity between <coughs> observer and observed. But when it is interpreted as prima facie evidence of Tanner's entire outlook on life, such characterization, I think, fails to address the structural context in which Tanner shifted his views on race at different times. As the curator Dewey Mosby explains, instead of rejecting his ethnic ancestry per se, what Tanner objected to was the term Negro. And in the 1890s, he was not alone. Du Bois associated the word with the bygone era of slavery and argued for the use of a capital N so as to re-signify its meaning. And such a crisis of self-naming defined reconstruction as a struggle over the language in which the social realities of race would be apprehended and acted upon. Where it is, under, uh, where it is understood to describe the reconstruction of black civil society after emancipation, a dialogic approach considers the term to be metaphorically apt in view of the constructionist account of the constitutive role of representation in the production of social identities. Rather than a given essence waiting to be named, black subjectivity is itself born out of a struggle over the use of proper names. It is constructed and reconstructed anew out of the crisis of denotative meaning surrounding each available term all of which carry competing and antagonistic connotations. In his 1913 study called The African Abroad or His Evolution in Western Civilization, tracing his development under Caucasian milieu, the black sociologist W.H. Ferris indeed explained this very dilemma in the following terms, quote, scholars and scientists are in despair as to what term will best classify the hybrid an ostracized group of individuals who are known as Negroes, colored people, African Americans. Negro will not do because that ethnologically refers to the full-blooded Negro in Africa or of African descent living elsewhere, whereas more than 50% of the colored population in America has more or less of Anglo-Saxon blood in its veins." End quote. So shifting the grounds for our reading and interpretation of Tanner's realism, dialogical methods enable us to explore the semantic maelstrom that infused the reconstruction vocabulary of race with complex and often contradictory meanings. The invocation of blood, for example, denoted hereditary and descent, but far from being fixed in biological essentialism, it contended with competing concepts of environment and culture as the hemispheric or even diasporic scope of um, uh, Ferris's study implies. And examining one of Tanner's major statements of his own self-identification as an artist, which was ex expressed in a 1914 letter to an American critic who planned a monograph, we should notice that his choice of words and indeed his sometimes obtruse grammar uh, 
calls for careful scrutiny of the slippage between the poorest categories of race, culture, and nationality as they circulated in the Reconstruction era. Indeed, I decided to type the whole thing out because reading it over and over, I'm never quite sure where the emphasis lies. It's, it's a very complex construction. So this is Tanner speaking in 1914. The only thing I take exception to is the inference in your last paragraph. You say, in his personal life, Mr. T has had many things to contend with. Ill health, poverty, and race prejudice, always strong against a Negro. Now am I a Negro? Does not the three quarters of English blood in my veins, which, when it flowed in pure Anglo-Saxon men, and which had done in the past effective and distinguished work in the US, does this not count for anything? Does the one quarter or one eighth of pure Negro blood in my veins count for all? I believe it. The Negro blood counts and counts to my advantage, though it has caused me at times a life of great humiliation and sorrow. But that it is the source of all my talents, if I have any, I do not believe. Any more than I believe, it all comes from my English ancestors. I suppose, according to the distorted way things are seen in the States, my blonde, curly-headed little boy would be Negro. True, this condition has driven me out of the country. But still, my best friends I have are white Americans, and I cannot sing our national hymn, Land of Liberty, etc. Still, deep down in my heart, I love it, and I'm sometimes sad that I cannot live where my heart is. Now, not being able to live where my heart is, is, I think, as succinct a definition of diaspora life as any. But in the absence of a question mark, Tanner's quizzical utterance, now am I a Negro, demands to be read as an overdetermined condensation of the multiple pressures that threw post-emancipation identities into a condition of flux. Visiting the United States in 1897, Tanner attended inaugural meetings of the American Negro Academy, which was a select group of intelligentsia led by Alexander Crummel to promote black scholarship in tertiary education. At its second meeting, Du Bois presented The Conservation of Races, a speech whose invocation of blood ostensibly validated biological notions of race, even as Du Bois argued against assimilation by stressing the civilizational gifts that the Negro would bring to modernity in striving to realize the group ideals that would constitute a distinctive cultural identity. Quote, if in America it is to be proven for the first time in the modern world that Negroes are a nation stored with wonderful possibilities of culture, he argued, then their destiny is not a servile imitation of Anglo-Saxon culture, but a stalwart originality which shall unswervingly follow Negro ideals, end quote. So where the fluctuating terms of race, nationality, and culture create an interplay between deterministic notions of collective descent, on the one hand, and then on the other, voluntaristic calls for social action against discrimination, the text of Du Bois's 1897 speech openly acknowledged the undecidable quandary that arose from zero-sum approaches to the reconstruction of black identities. Okay, to resume my quotation from Conservation of Races. What, after all, am I? Am I an American or a Negro? Can I be both? Or is it my duty to cease to be a Negro as soon as possible and be an American? If I strive as a Negro, am I not perpetuating the very cleft that threatens and separates black and white America? Is not my only possible practical aim the subduction of all that is Negro in me to the American? Does my black blood place upon me any more obligation to assert my nationality than German or Irish or Italian blood would? End quote. So when Tanner reflected in his 1914 letter on the contradictory forces that drove me out of the country, we might say that he himself was thrust into the very cleft of such questions. Indeed, was it their ultimate undecidability that led him to emigrate? Tanner did not depart from a neutral situation, but embarked upon his Afro-Atlantic travels in part as a response to a domestic scene of ideological conflict to which, by all accounts, he was temperamentally ill-suited. <laughs> 
But the very fact of his involvement in these historic debates qualifies the view that Tanner simply removed himself from the politics of race to core. Taking account of his participation in the 1893 World Congress on Africa, we find that his standpoint on race and representation led him to a set of choices in which the banjo player actually fulfilled the stalwart originality that Du Bois called for. Held in Chicago alongside the World's Columbian Exposition, the 1893 World Congress on Africa marked one of the first occasions when black American intellectuals made use of the modern institution of world's fairs and international expositions as a public platform on which to address the transnational conditions of the black diaspora. Speaking from the Haitian Pavilion in his diplomatic capacity as its newly appointed ambassador, Frederick Douglass, for instance, called for the observance of a Colored People's Day. The three-day event took stock of the entire post-emancipation period, and it was in this context that Tanner presented a paper entitled The American Negro in Art. And although the text of his speech is now lost, a contemporary report of October 1893 describes how Tanner, quote, spoke of Negro painters and sculptors and claimed that actual achievement proves Negroes to possess ability and talent for successful competition with white artists, end quote. And in a document that Tanner prepared a year later in 1894, in which he refers to himself in the third person, the artist reveals the catalytic role of the Congress on Africa in clarifying his own critical ambitions as a realist painter. Quote, since his return from Europe, he has painted mostly Negro subjects. He feels drawn to such subjects on account of the newness of the field and because of a desire to represent the serious and pathetic side of life among them. And it is his thought that other things being equal, he who has the most sympathy with his subjects will obtain the best results. To his mind, many of the artists who have represented Negro life have only seen the comic, the ludicrous side of it and have lacked sympathy with an appreciation for the warm, big heart that dwells within such a rough exterior, end quote. Now, in setting out this qualitative distinction between the serious and the comic in representations of Negro life, I think Tanner clearly positions himself in an adversarial relationship towards stereotypical imagery of blackness. By pitching his realism against precedents that depicted black family life as a low culture genre, of mere comedic entertainment, Tanner stated his aim of making a diacritical intervention within the commonplace iconography of blackness. Entering into a back and forth dialogue with Thomas Hovenden and Thomas Eakins, who were two of his teachers at Pennsylvania, as well as with earlier artists such as William Sidney Mount and Eastman Johnson, whose paintings had depicted the banjo as a signifier of minstrelsy, we find that Tanner's appropriative re-accentuation of the banjo's iconography articulated an act of asymmetrical code sharing that began to dislodge the fixity of this signifier in late 19th century American visual culture. So now by way of um, entering into an analysis of the banjo player uh, to think about the steps that uh, led uh, Tanner to his choices. In the pre-Civil War era, genre pieces such as William Sidney Mount's The Banjo Player of 1856 recuperated the stereotype of the minstrel entertainer into the realm of the bourgeois home. Mimicking the songs, dances, and dialects of the black slaves he observed, the English actor Charles Matthews had toured the United States in 1822 as a comic impersonator whose blackface act was then followed by Thomas Dartmouth Rice in 1836. And the character of Jim Crow, thereby introduced into vaudeville and musical theater, established minstrelsy, excuse me, as an institution of popular culture that was associated with the bawdy <coughs> revelry of the urban white working classes. So its incorporation into the high culture of the fine arts then was indicative of a shift towards specifically American content in domestic genre paintings in which blacks featured prominently. An example of this would be uh, Farmer's Nooning of 1836, also by William Sidney Mount. Uh, 
uh, and another work by Mount, The Bone Player of 1856. But such artwork, it's important to add, also gave tacit to support to the pro-slavery vision of American national identity. By mid-century, the banjo playing minstrel had become a commonplace signifier of sentimental nostalgia for a way of life that was perceived to be threatened by emancipation. This outlook was precisely what Eastman Johnson connoted in Life at the South, also known as Old Kentucky Home of 1859. Uh, and indeed, this subtitle was added after a popular song in the 1880s. And if we look at the mise-en-scene of its composition, uh, the rear facade of a decaying slum falls away to display a banjo player at its very center who is theatrically put on show alongside an entire family of antebellum stereotypes. We have, um, yeah. we have Aunt Jemima, a red kerchief tied around her head, uh, who is present in the upper story window, and another mammy figure uh, plays with children in the foreground. The young couple who are engaged in a tete-a-tete -tete in the left foreground embody the figures of Sapphire and Buck. And on the far right, a white female figure steps through a side door, thereby becoming a spectator to be entertained by the spectacle created by these others. She is a voyeur whose presence cues the intended viewing position that the spectator is invited to occupy. According to Albert Boyne, the figures are, quote, the servants of Johnson's own father, shown in the backyard of the family house in Washington, D.C. But I think any observational realism is entirely surrendered to the highly staged pictorial construction whereby Johnson implicitly acknowledges the theatrical and literary sources of the imagery of typification that his work draws upon. Now, for his part, Ekins also featured blacks in genre paintings, such as the sporting life that is depicted in Rail Shooting, Will Schuster and Black Man Go Shooting of 1876. <coughs> but in contrast to Johnson and Mount, Ekins's realist interest in empirical observation and objective detachment resulted in a subsequent watercolor Negro Boy Dancing of 1878, where the banjo acquired a very different connotation. Rather than an entertainer who is performing for others, the musician on the left and the older man at the center of the composition are mutually concentrating on the boy on the right. The music and dance evoked in this scene are activities that black subjects undertake by themselves and for themselves, not for others. In view of what one scholar calls, quote, the ethnographic detail of Negro boy dancing, which includes the oval portrait of Lincoln in the far background, we might also notice how additional elements, such as the top hat and cane on the chair, all work to, quote, evoke post-war urbanity, not plantation comedy. Such detail makes the subject picturesque and informative, but it also allows the individual figures a complex humanity, very different from the good-natured darkies in contemporary images by Hovenden and others. That's a quotation from Kathleen Foster. Now, with this allusion to Thomas Hovenden, um, and in particular to his painting Dem Was Good Times of 1882, which is a portrayal of an old black man in patches standing beside a banjo that's placed on a chair, we encounter ambiguities that arise from a structural context where artistic intentions and audience reception intersect under extremely volatile, rapidly changing conditions. On the one hand, in light of Hovenden's mentorship of Tanner at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, there is an anti-racist outlook implicit in Hovenden's painterly homage to the white anti-slavery activist executed for treason in uh, the last moments of John Brown uh, of some two years later, 1884. And incidentally, Tanner's parents chose Osawa as his middle name uh, precisely in tribute to Old Brown of um, Osawa Tomi, 
the Kansas town in which John Brown's abolitionist activism had begun. But on the other hand, if we go back to this work of 1882, Hovenden's intentions as an artist were in a sense overridden by the dominant view amongst white northerners in the 1880s. And in this context, across elite and mass culture, antebellum nostalgia gained in ascendance. For as Kathleen Foster explains, quote, as the failures of reconstruction grew painfully <coughs> obvious, the sentimental view of black life in the antebellum South gained popularity in the North bringing minstrel songs, banjos, and Uncle Remus stories into bourgeois parlors and investing every image of African-American people, no matter how up to date, with old-timey overtones, end quote. So in this context, it's highly revealing to note that one critic viewed the old man in Denwood's Good Times as a happy-go-lucky character who cherishes memories of the amenities of slavery while he forgets its hardships, end quote. And with regard to um, Negro Boy Dancing by Eakins, just go back to it, another critic saw, quote, the serpentine insinuation of the banjo player as goblin humor, so true and intense as to notch a pretty high mark in the degree of comedy, end quote. So these are examples of how these works were interpreted in the uh, 1880s. And in an 1882 article in which critic Clarence Cook then compared Eakins's and Hovenden's black genre scenes, bearing in mind that Hovenden had previously specialized in realist scenes of Breton peasants before he'd moved to Philadelphia. Clarence Cook quipped that Hovenden had, quote, exchanged his Bretons for our darkies, end quote. Now, this racist remark is paradoxical because it actually gives us the hermeneutic key for understanding Tanner's intervention in the intertextual signifying chain surrounding the iconicity of the banjo. In keeping with the dialogic theorem which holds that any language is inhabited by the reversible connecting factor such that identical signifiers are liable to antagonistic modes of articulation depending on the signifying chain in which they're encoded, we need to take account of two steps that Tanner took leading up to the banjo lesson. The first was actually a misstep. Old couple looking at a portrait of Lincoln of 1892-93 was Tanner's initial rejoinder to Eakins. The portrait being looked at picks up from that detail in Negro Boy Dancing and Tanner's iconography also includes a top hat and cane, I do apologize for the low resolution of the image, which connotes hard-earned respectability on the part of his black working class subjects. The painting also makes a passing reference to Sunday Morning by Thomas Hovenden, which depicts an elderly couple who are attending to domestic chores. Now, where Hovenden evoked in the words of Hugh Honor, picturesque poverty, it is fair to say that in his case, go back to it, Tanner's sketchily rendered anecdotal piece, uh, to quote from Linda Roscoe Hartigan, failed to generate a meaningful semantic differential. For in compositional terms, his figures are subservient to the portrait that they are both looking at. Tanner's second step, however, involved a double-sided transposition of elements that he had assembled from his Atlantic crossing. And it's altogether more revealing with regards to the semiotic transformations that he carried out within the iconography of genre painting as a whole. Tanner had spent summer 1892 painting Au Plain Air in Brittany. And in the bagpipe lesson of 1892-93, he depicted an old man and a young boy who are chanteurs populaires who roam the region presenting impromptu entertainments. Set in an orchard, this genre scene is played as gentle comedy. The boy grapples with the musical instrument to the amusement of the old man. Now, previous studies rarely observe the interrelationship of doubling between the bagpipe lesson and the banjo lesson. But by reassembling 
this work, breaking it down into component parts and then transposing it from a rural peasant scene in France to a working class African American domestic interior, Tanner's intentions for the banjo lessons were indisputably shaped by a dialectic of Afro-Atlantic translation. In the sense that his diasporic voyaging had given him access to more than one imaginative viewpoint, the shift from the comedic to the serious that he set into motion by translating the bagpipe lesson into the banjo lesson was not only made possible by Tanner's travels outside the United States, but the very act of substitution whereby an African-American artist exchanged his Bretons for our darkies, as it were, lays bare with stark precision the conditions of asymmetrical code sharing in which Tanner's act of doubling was performed across the two works. Now, the banjo lesson's formal structure may owe a technical debt to Eakinson's realist emphasis on objective reportage. For in point of fact, Hannah employed study photographs to arrive at the overall composition for the painting. In this manner, the high angled viewing plane that raises the floor to a rake degree allows us to see how the two figures are fully immersed in their mutual concentration on the musical instrument as they are infused with a glow of warm amber tones that emanate from two complementary sources which suggest a uh, window at left and a hearth at right. The young boy and the old man are brought to life by Tanner's handling of luminous techniques which add layers of expressive depth to his humanist realism. By virtue of their interlocking focus on the process of learning, both figures avert their gaze from the viewers. Privileging their inward absorption in the shared activity of music making, Tanner issues a subtle but irrevocable break within the intertextual chain that links the banjo lesson, lesson sorry, to the prior series of works by Mount, Johnson, Hovenden, and Eakins. By composing a scene that conveys the familial and intergenerational unity of the boy who is being taught how to play a musical instrument by an elder, Tanner presents an educational scene of instruction that rejects the heteronomy or other directedness that had previously fixed the iconography of the banjo as a servile emblem of minstrelsy in which blackness was encoded as a sign to connote entertainment for others. There is, moreover, something else at play in Tanner's act of appropriation of the banjo's iconography. And this supplementary dimension throws the issue of stalwart originality into an entirely different light. By taking it out of its fixed place in the dominant iconography and recoding it within an intra-black familial scene of domestic intimacy and interiority, Tanner did nothing less than to restore the banjo to its original diasporic context. And what exactly do I mean by this? The banjo is a unique product of new world creolization. It simply did not exist as such prior to transatlantic slavery. Organology identifies the banjo as a hybrid musical instrument that on the one hand combines elements of the West African lute that is to say the calabash or gourd uh, as its body, which is topped by a sound table, uh, and this instrument is known in Gambia and Senegal as an aconte. Combining these elements with wooden pegs that stretch and hold the strings with pegs in the style of European lutes, on the other hand. And this cross-cultural musical instrument was documented by Sir Hans Sloan, uh, in his 19, sorry, his 1707 account of his voyage to Jamaica as a bonjo, and it was referred to as a bania uh, in John Gabriel Steedman's 1796 narrative of his expedition to Suriname. It was recorded as being used by Carolina slaves in the 1790s, and by the 1840s, the calabash resonator had been replaced by a wooden hoop that was most likely formed from staves that were appropriated, literally ripped away from packing cases made of timber. <laughs> 
So once we acknowledge how the banjo's cross-cultural history involves an inventiveness that was first taken out of the hands of blacks by white impersonators, whose blackface minstrelsy was produced by an initial act of appropriation, then what Tanner did as a black artist who had entered the privileged institution of the fine arts was to undertake a second act of appropriation in which the aim was to take it back again. In this second act of appropriation, the agonistic process of recapture and recoding involved in this intertextual production of the banjo lesson dramatizes the back and forth dynamics of diasporic translation and cross-cultural appropriation as the very basis of black originality in the visual arts. It is by taking a signifying element, sorry, it is by taking back a signifying element that was first taken out of its original context by white expropriation that the diasporic conditions of artistic and cultural production make such a signifier culturally black for the first time. It is thus highly significant, if we go back to the banjo lesson, that the grey-haired grandfather figure who imparts the lesson is responsible for the transmission of neo-African cultural traditions. For his seniority makes him a living witness to the history of the musical instrument that connects him to the boy. His generational status testifies to the lived experience of a time prior to emancipation, that is to say the era of slavery itself, even as the lesson he gives is orientated towards a future continuance of a distinctively black form of expressive culture. On this reading, the banjo lesson exceeds the convention of American genre painting, for it asks to be read instead as a form of history painting. It does not merely break the signifying chain that was built up around the banjo as an icon of black cultural difference, but iconographically trumps the entire intertextual sequence in which it was encoded as a diacritical utterance. And it also points to a supplementary subtext in which the banjo's resignification opens up alternative understandings of the 1860s to the 1890s period that was subject to reevaluation during Reconstruction. And um, I have an image of the African-American musical performer, uh, Les Snowden, of the 1870s, to give a hint of this alternative history, as it were, of the, the banjo's cross-cultural roots, its cross-cultural genesis. So finally, in our account of the banjo lesson, the sweet irony whereby Tanner exchanged his Bretons for African-American subjects is enhanced all the more once we are aware of another artist who was also present at the 1893 Congress on Africa, who was the poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Dunbar's Oak and Ivy collection of 1892 included a banjo song, which was a poem that employed vernacular dialect in a manner that is comparable to Tanner's empathetic realism. So across literary and visual texts, both artists were reclaiming cultural elements that had been previously devalued as other. Black dialect was mimicked by white impersonators as a source of mirth. But the irony whereby Tanner exchanged African-American subjects for his 1892 depiction of uh, Brittany chanteurs populaire, who were, of course, peasant troubadours who perform a minstrel role in their own indigenous culture, only hints at the humanist largesse that Tanner brought to his worldly outlook as an Afro-Atlantic artist. So moving on to the thankful poor, without moralism or sentimentality, the black family in the thankful poor was similarly depicted in the ordered realm of the private black domestic sphere. As the child emulates the elder's example and they each bow their heads in prayer before a meal, Tanner's realism touches on the themes of character formation that was such a key concern during Reconstruction. Indeed, as the art historian Judith Wilson points out, the background debates on the relative influences of heredity or environment formed the structural context in which both of these works were produced. For, as she states, if the banjo lesson debunks a widespread myth of innate black musicality, then the thankful poor 
counters an equally prevalent contemporary perception of black religiosity as overwhelmingly emotional. In light of Tanner's family background in the AME, a church that formed the very bedrock of African-American civil society, Wilson draws out the conflict whereby, quote, in its stress on education, the AME church tended to promote a European-derived cultural values, and its rhetoric of black self-esteem was often accompanied by revulsion for certain traditional African practices, end quote. A case in point is that in 1878, Bishop Daniel Payne, for instance, denounced the expressive vernacular ring shout sermons in which black worshippers clapped their hands and stamped their feet in the most ridiculous and heathenish way, end quote. As the editor of the Christian Recorder, Reverend uh, Benjamin Tucker Tanner had supported secular struggles for civil rights, but the title of his 1869 publication, The Negro's Origins and Is the Negro Cursed, indicates the turmoil that was involved in Reconstruction era struggles to reconcile the distinctive qualities of black expressive culture, that is difference, with the uplifting affirmation of black achievement in the name of equality, that is an emphasis on sameness. In this respect then, while the two paintings are closely related, the semantic differentiation inscribed across race and ethnicity in the case of the banjo and its contested iconography is now reconfigured as an intra-black division between the rough and respectable classes within black life itself. To the extent that reconstruction was conceived in either or terms, Wilson shows that this dualistic stance was reproduced in the contending views of Du Bois and Washington. Seeking to refute supremacist racism, universalist claims of equality that stressed accommodation existed in tension with assertions of cultural distinctiveness that emphasized separateness. And although the positivist logic of dualism would be later displaced by the alternative conceptual logic of double consciousness, that is to say within the discourse of early 20th century Pan-Africanism, it would be, I think, instructive to observe how Tanner's work was perceived by um, Du Bois and Washington alike. In his 1901 autobiography, Up From Slavery, Washington recorded his visit to the Musée de Luxembourg in Paris in the following words, quote, few people ever stopped, I found, when looking at his pictures to inquire whether Mr. Tanner was a Negro painter, a French painter, a German painter. They simply knew that he was able to produce something which the world wanted, a great painting, and the matter of his color did not enter their minds." End quote. Once we notice in this passage that Washington is not actually addressing the content or form of Tanner's art, but rather what it can be taken to represent, which is interpreted in this case as support for a universalist stance in which color is immaterial, then we can see how this pattern was repeated in 1908 when um, Washington referenced Tanner by name. Quote, Tanner is proud of his race. He feels deeply that as a representative of his people, he is on trial to establish their right to be taken seriously in the world of art. But even though this references Tanner by name, it's only to position the artist as being representative of black achievement rather than as a producer or agent of artistic meanings in his own right. Turning to the opening chapter of The Souls of Black Folks, Du Bois counterposed an unnamed black artist in the elite world of the fine arts with the expressive distinctiveness of the black masses. And he described this high, low contrast as a tragic conflict. Quote, the innate love of harmony and beauty that set the ruder souls of his people a dancing and a singing raised but confusion and doubt in the soul of the black artist, for the beauty revealed to him was the sole beauty of a race which his larger audience despised." End quote. Now, while his concept of double consciousness later provided a means of resolving the limitations of dualism, we should observe that in the drive to validate black cultural difference and distinctiveness, Du Bois resorts to an either-or reasoning that positions the non-vernacular black artist as internally divided by competing definitions of beauty on the part of white and black audiences. So the intra-communal cleft 
between rough and respectable classes is thus as much at play as the high-low distinction in this polarization between the cultural distinctiveness that secures the originality of black expression and the inner, quote, doubt in the soul of the black artist who is seen to be at risk of assimilation. So despite their profound political and philosophical differences, we can observe that both Du Bois and Washington nonetheless tend to approach Tanner not in terms of his style or iconography or content, but on the basis of what his professional identity as an artist is, uh, can be taken to mean as a representative of black progress and achievement. In this regard then, as they rhetorically expropriate his artistic identity for their own political and ideological purposes, there is in fact an uncanny echo of the double bind that faced black artists in previous structural contexts where their relations with uh, patrons and supporters, however well intended, was profoundly asymmetrical. In an earlier era, abolitionists had supported black artists as living evidence of the Negro's equal competence, whereas in Reconstruction, the black intelligentsia offered full-bodied support to artists such as Tanner, who was widely admired but at the cost of imposing a burden of representation. The meaning of his work was taken out of the artist's hands and effectively made secondary to the discursive and rhetorical positioning of the black artist as a representative of his race. In the subsequent period of the New Negro Movement and then the Harlem Renaissance proper, Elaine Locke was amongst the first to break out of this impasse by addressing the aesthetic ontology of the art object um, as a focus of attention in its own right. Even though uh, one of Locke's abiding concerns for art that would be, in his terms, racially representative. But before we get to the implicitly dialogical aspects of Locke's practice as an art historian and art critic, with, which is the theme with which I'd like to conclude these lectures, there are two last observations to be made with regards to Tanner's Atlantic recrossings. Supported by white patrons from the world of higher education, uh, the banjo lesson was purchased by Robert C. Ogden, who was a board member of Hampton Institute. And Tanner was sponsored in Paris by Rodmond Wanamaker, a Philadelphia businessman who presided over the American Art Association in Paris. There was a political paradox surrounding Tanner's choice of exile. At home in the United States, when black content was present in his paintings, the iconographic originality he produced was overlooked on account of the urgent political exigencies of reconstruction, even though Tanner himself was praised highly by the African-American elite. As an expatriate in France, he was integrated within the art establishment, but the absence of black content in his religious paintings led to the view that his acceptance was conditional upon an act of assimilation that had rendered his race and ethnicity invisible. So on the one hand then, his emigration may be seen as taking flight from the intra-black divisions of the Reconstruction era, as well as from the discrimination that he had earlier faced as a Philadelphia art student. Even though on the other hand, his self-description of being unable to live where my heart is, as he said in 1914, reveals a hard-won or even bitter awareness of the double bind that was built into the asymmetries of the context in choice, of the context of choice that was historically available to him. <coughs> Hence, when we look at Tanner's biblical scenes in light of the diasporic push of the dystopian incentive to leave and the utopian pull towards a potential alternative, we observe a cluster of stylistic features that qualify the view that his choice of travel simply meant the abandonment of his social responsibility as an African-American artist. I think rather than a total erasure of his ethnic identity, Tanner's journeys suggest a lateral displacement that did not wholly obliterate the Afro-Christian wellspring from which his religious worldview was shaped. In other words, diasporic life was merely veiled in translation. <clears throat> 
Throughout his sketching tours of the Levantine in the 1890s and subsequent visits to Algiers in 1908 and then Morocco in 1912, Tanner's observational realism directs our attention towards changing conditions of light and shade. But whereas European Orientalist painters pursued a naturalism that favored daylight conditions in which differences of skin tone produced visually racialized antithesis, the nocturnal luminosity of his flight into Egypt, or the twilight gloaming that suffuses a work such as The Disciples See Christ Walking on the Water of 1907, shrouds Tanner's figures with ambiguity. This blurring of ethnic identification on the part of his figures is also consistent with his studio-based compositions, uh, such as Daniel in the Lion's Den that we saw previously, where the almost theatrical use of chiaroscuro dramatizes Daniel's predicament as his downcast face is lit up by um, a shaft of light that pierces the surrounding darkness. Now, this ambiguous blurring does not attenuate phenotype as the sculptures of Edmonia Lewis did, so much as it expresses a philosophical outlook that is consistent with Tanner's Christian universalism. There's also another dimension. The shared tradition of Afro-Christian exegesis suggests another link that concerns cross-cultural translations between African and Jewish experiences of diaspora, which, as Paul Gilroy defines it, is inaugurated by, quote, flight following the threat of violence rather than by freely chosen experiences of displacement, end quote. Wandering far and away from his homeland as an African-American who was already exiled in Europe, Tanner's travels throughout the Middle East uh, and throughout Palestine, when we read them in light of the significance that was given to the parable of Daniel by James Weldon Johnson, who knew Tanner personally, and this will be in the context of his 1925 anthology, the book of American Negro Spirituals, can be understood to underline and confirm Gilroy's view that, quote, the idea of diaspora transcoded from its biblical sources and the Jewish traditions in which it is articulated proved to be very useful to black thinkers as they struggle to comprehend the dynamics of identity and belonging constituted between the poles of geography and genealogy, end quote. At the Académie Julienne in Paris, a weekly drawing competition was held on Sunday evenings, but Tanner's devout religious observances led him to petition for it to be held on Monday. Quote, Never have I seen or heard such bedlam, Tanner wrote in 1909. And as Bearden and Henderson note, Paris constantly surprised Tanner. But perhaps his biggest surprise was when during these classes, he heard fellow students from France sing spirituals, apparently picked up from European tours of the Fisk Jubilee singers. So far from disqualifying him from a black Atlantic perspective, the choices that Tanner selected from his experiences as a world traveler place him in continuity with Lewis and Duncanson. In each case, the second journey of recrossing that was chosen voluntarily transformed the first crossing of the Middle Passage that had been a journey of forced migration. Although Tanner settled permanently in France and Duncanson only spent a few years sojourn, each artist participated in a transnational dynamic of circulatory migration between two or more spaces. And this is a common feature that is highlighted above all by the back and forth movement that we saw in the case of Edmonia Lewis. In the sense that signature works created under these conditions, we've looked at the land of the Lotus Eaters, Forever Free, uh, and today the Banjo Lesson. Uh, to the extent that each of these signature works generated an aesthetics of doubleness and ambiguity. It is precisely the reiterative dynamic between the first journey of dispossession and expropriation and the second journey of repossession and reappropriation that upholds Gilroy's insight that in the imaginative spaces of the Black Atlantic, quote, what was initially felt to be a curse, the curse of homelessness or exile, gets repossessed. It becomes affirmed and is reconstructed as the basis of a privileged standpoint from which certain useful and critical perceptions of the modern world become more likely, end quote. <clears throat> 
So this second act of repossession, which, as we've seen, is the founding or inaugural gesture of the will to form that takes back that which has already been taken from the diasporized subject, is in fact further confirmed in the view of art critic Jean Fisher. Following Walter Benjamin's understanding of the traumatic nature of modernity, Fisher addresses contemporary art, but her insights are equally applicable to the 19th century. Our grasp of the very shape of time under diasporic circumstances is at stake in her view that, quote, if the founding event of the African diaspora can be said to be the Middle Passage, then it signaled not simply a departure from ancestral belonging. It inaugurated what Kathy Carruth, in her gloss on Freud's narrative of the Israelites' exodus from Egypt in Moses and Monotheism, refers to as a departure into a newly established future that is no longer continuous with the past, but is united with it through profound discontinuity." End quote. And because art history tended to assume that the nation state was a neutral container in which art was visually produced, it is perhaps unsurprising that there have been so many difficulties dealing with the ruptures, the repetitions, the reversibilities that characterize um, diaspora cultures. However, in his understanding of art history as a dialectical process, Alain Locke prefigured the dialogical perspective that I've tried to lay out in these three talks, when in 1940 he published The Negro in Art, a pictorial record of the Negro artist and of the Negro theme in art. Consisting of photographic reproductions that were organized into three portfolios, the picture book format of the uh, Negro in art lent itself towards accessibility. Uh, the plates were accompanied in each case by brief biographies and introductory texts. And yet the conceptual architecture of the book is really a feat of modernist scholarship that situates Locke uh, alongside Walter Benjamin and Abby Vorberg in terms of how photographic reproductions enable an a new understanding of art's historicity. The first section in the book, The Negro as Artist, starts with Joshua Johnston, whose black identity, let's bear in mind, had only been discovered in 1939, and includes work by Lewis, Tanner, and Duncanson, even if there is an element of misattribution involved in uh, the, the upper case, before it comes up to date with artists of the 1930s and the Harlem Renaissance period. And I think it's important to acknowledge Sergeant Johnson's work of 1933, Forever Free, as a self-consciously intertextual reference back to the inaugural gesture made by Edmonia Lewis in 1867. But going beyond chronological documentation alone, the second section of the book, The Negro in Art, selected depictions of blacks as subjects in Western art uh, from Velasquez uh, in 17th century Spain right up to Joshua Reynolds in 18th century England. Now, aiming to counteract the tendency to, quote, misconstrue the art of the Negro as a ghetto province in the world of art, Locke's starting point was that, quote, to treat adequately, even in the barest outline, the art history of the Negro, one should trace, in addition to the career of the Negro artist, excuse me, the course of the Negro theme in art generally. Now, we can observe that this utterance is itself a doubling and it hints at a double-sided approach that did not just establish a backstory for African-American art as a national or minority formation, but pointed up instead the symbolic centrality of the image of the black and Western art at, at moments in the cultural history of modernity. So taken together, the two uh, portfolios thus thematize a dialogical relationship in the social relations of race and representation. The history of depictions in which blackness is the object of someone else's gaze is but one element of the overall context in which black artists struggle to gain access to the institutions of art as the subjects of representation um, in their own right, producing art by themselves, for themselves. To the extent that Locke's organization of the material implies a dialectical relationship between the object and the subject of representations of blackness, then his picture book does not just pr propose an interactive model for understanding artistic productions, 
uh, under social conditions of diaspora. And we should bear in mind that Locke is insisting here that there will always be a scene of cross-cultural dialogue when peoples meet, to quote the title of another work. But I think it's important to say that the Negro in art also doubles as a critical intervention in the epistemological field of art history in terms of understanding the constant entanglement of different cultures as one of the basic conditions of modernity. Hence, it is revealing that the third portfolio, uh, which is actually titled The Ancestral Arts, has a Janus-like aspect. It simultaneously looks backwards to ancient African art and forwards into a hybridized futurity that has been opened up by black diaspora influences in the visual languages of modernism. Juxtaposing a Cota reliquary figure with Picasso's Little Dancer of Avignon of 1907, the moment of dialectical synthesis is brought to rest at a place of crossroads. But the implicit argument is that the dialogical relations that have informed the cultural history of modernity only become visible for the first time with the advent of modernism. Now clearly the Negro in art takes us into the very different conditions and circumstances of art in the 20th century. And visually I just wanted to end with um, Bearden's homage to Duncan and of the Lotus Eaters with which we began from his Black Odyssey series. But my final point is that what matters is how Locke's approach um, focused on the problem of inauguration. And with the support of his proto-dialogical method of investigation, the questions of ambiguity and doubleness that we've brought to light amongst 19th century Afro-Atlantic artists points us, I think, towards an interesting horizon for future debates that have the potential to renew the field of art history as a whole. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you for great lectures. Um, I wanted, I especially like how you ended it, um, coming full circle. Uh, I have a question about uh, the quote that you have from that amazing long quote that you have from um, Tanner, in which you say, I cannot live with where my heart is. Mm -hmm. And you suggest, you say that that, you know, is a crucial aspect of that diaspora. But I'm wondering, um, it occurs to me that in some ways that is more, to, in my, to my ear, much more of an expression of exile, right? Um, because uh, as opposed to diaspora, because for me diaspora is, um, implies much more that the heart is everywhere in some ways, so dispersed, right? Um, mm -hmm. Whereas I think it, in his consideration of America, as he's speaking of a, a specific place from which he has exiled himself, right? Mm. So I'm wondering if you could distinguish a bit between diaspora and exile. Okay, that's a great question. It's well taken and absolutely important not to merge the different concepts of exile and diaspora. Although what they do share in common is the sense of estrangement between identity and place. And that marks uh, the big distinction between the way in which cultural identities have been conceptualized within the sort of Eurocentered tradition. Uh, German artists come from Germany, they stay in Germany. That's what German art is. And I'm not caricaturing art historians as, as having, you know, rigidly adhered to that approach. But notions of exile and diaspora introduce an estrangement, a displacement, a non-identity, uh, a, a non-correspondence between an artist's sense of self and where they are. Um, having said that, I think that um, your point is absolutely important and does need to be sharpened because this was a choice uh, he made to live as an expatriate in France. He actively chose exile, whereas the defining feature of diaspora is uh, that they're involuntary um, migrations. It's uh, flights following the threat of violence. They're forced displacements, which is why I was emphasizing the theme of the second act of recrossing, the second act of taking back 
Um, nonetheless, I think relative to uh, previous studies uh, that do tend to characterize um, Tanner as very aloof, uh, that during the 20s when the Harlem Renaissance was flourishing and he appeared on the cover of Crisis magazine and so on, there he was in France, part of the French art establishment, but seeming to give very little back to the younger generations. And I think there's a, a sense that comes across to me in the work of, of uh, generations of art historians, um, James Porter, Cedric Dover, of a kind of disappointed, uh, disappointedness uh, that um, he'd abandoned a sense of solidarity with those left behind in the United States. So um, against that background and that characterization of Tanner, uh, I, want, I thought it was very important to emphasize that he was conflicted, that not being able to live where my heart is, while we might refine that in terms of exilic rather than diasporic, nonetheless indicates that um, he not only left a situation that wasn't neutral, but even as an expatriate who was professionally successful, there was an inner conflict and I wanted to suggest that perhaps there are traces of that that, um, that are not so much expressed but work through creatively in the um, Afro-Christian themes that he chose, such as the flight from Egypt. Thank you. I mean, just taking your last um, very um, exciting cry for a, a new art history and seeing this as the basis of a new art history. Um, could you also apply the, the, many of these notions, say, to um, the artists who came to America in the late 30s and 40s and see it as, uh, in a way, an issue that goes beyond simply blackness but into a much wider sense of diaspora that is, if you like, non-racial altogether? Absolutely. That's a great question. It follows on so perfectly from the first one. And that was very much the focus of the last book in the series, Exiles, Diasporas and Strangers. And again, one faces this cleft in which one doesn't want to overgeneralize that exile, migration and diaspora are all identical. But they do nonetheless involve travel, movement, displacement, that art history as a discipline has had difficulty conceptualizing. And that's changing creatively and, and radically. Um, but absolutely, I think it, my response to your question would, would be that it's an as well as, that you have quasi-diasporic formations, such as the emigre um, art historians, many of whom came from Jewish backgrounds, uh, many of whom came from Eastern European backgrounds, who fled totalitarian Europe in the, um, in the 1930s and who migrated all over the world, many of whom chose to come to the States because of the ways in which um, institutions, such as museums, Museum of Modern Art had opened in the 1930s, but also universities were very hospitable. They offered them a place. And in his contribution to the book, Stephen Mansbach, um, art historian who's based at um, University of Maryland in um, Baltimore, talks about some of the paradoxical effects that this had. Um, that yeah, we can just imagine that traumatized and shell-shocked um, by the you know, conditions of, of Nazi uh, Europe, the choices that they made as scholars was to downplay the politics of the, the historical avant-garde. And this resulted in a kind of neutralized or sanitized conception of the early history of modernism, which some argue, and it's an argument that I think I tend to support, resulted in um, sort of formed an alliance with some of the preoccupations of the, um, America, the newly formed American institutions. So that you had, by the post-war period, survey texts, but also institutional displays that worked to minimize the political content and the political motivation of, of practices such as abstraction, for example, constructivism. And you had a purely formal, formalistic or stylistic understanding of history as being this progress, you know, a succession of styles that one begets, begets another. So um, I think there is an opportunity for art history to take on board the ways in which material experiences of travel, displacement, and circulation 
affect the conditions under which art is both produced, not just art, but art history and art criticism, um, and the way in which that history is transmitted. Uh, and I, I think that art history of the black diaspora has a leading role to play in terms of suggesting models that can be translated into other, other experiences. Um, I, I have two questions, uh, separate but uh, related. Uh, the first question is, um, I, I see your project as a, as a retroactive construction of a tradition. Uh, and I, you may correct me here because it's retroactive to the extent that it was not the, a black Atlantic tradition of art making and reception was not a dominant or even emergent you know, mode of discourse mm -hmm. that was contemporaneous with the artists you discuss. So I'm asking you to please clarify that little. What's at stake here in this act of retroactive construction of a tradition? Especially in the light of my second observation, my second question, which is that Tana, as you present him today, actually presents a far more formidable case for what you are making. In, this, in, two, in, two, in at least two senses of, of the case you're making. One, there's real content in the materials that you produce, whereas in the two, in Lewis and Dorgansen, there is a, you t talk of allegories and indirection and subtext, but in Turner, there's real content, you know, to, uh, to um, marshal for your arguments for this black Atlantic tradition. And secondly, and equally importantly, there is what you call an intramural discourse <coughs> out of which Turner is speaking and to which he's responding. And there's, there's almost nothing of this with the two previous artists. Mm. So it seems to me that there's a teleology that you are in, in, in indicating that Tana is closer to us, and therefore the tradition becomes more you know, visible, more evident with Tana mm -hmm. than with the others. So yeah. the origination which you place in the others you know, come from Tana. So what, what exactly you know, is at stake here mm. in this retroactive construction of the tradition, which was not contemporaneous? Right, okay. Um, the first question about tradition is very important. Um, life is lived forwards, it's understood backwards. I think that was Kierkegaard, I might be wrong. Our history begins in the 1930s. It begins after the Harlem Renaissance with the discovery of Joshua Johnson, which is still contested, it's not definitive. And the Negro in art in 1940 is therefore one of the first statements of what this tradition might be. And it's important that Locke conceives of this as being dialectical, interactive, um, that there's a dynamic going on between how blacks are seen by non-blacks and how blacks see themselves. By the time we get to the 50s and 60s, or even more recently in the 70s, something happened whereby the story was told as a separatist narrative. There's a disconnect between the critique of exclusion that did marginalize artists of color. It wasn't just an ideological construct, it really did happen. Um, and to counteract that, we had a, a, a form of narration that minimized the interactive relationship because to be diasporized is to be thrown into a situation that is not of your choice so that you're compelled to interact with others. It's intrinsically cosmopolitan. Um, but this is not reflected when you have a separatist narrative in which it seems that black artists only interact with other black artists. And what effect does that have, both from the point of view of museums or universities? It reinforces the marginality. Why should we give attention to this subject, this su subdisciplinary specialism, if it's so inwardly directed? So what you're describing about tradition, uh, you're, the raising about tradition is crucially important and, and very much unresolved. 
Uh, and I think that that's the genius, if you like, the insight of Locke, which perhaps subsequent generations of art, art historians, including Caribbean art historians, or, and those addressing the black British situation, have neglected. That to be in diaspora is to be constantly engaged in a cross-cultural situation uh, in which you're engaged with otherness. And it's as if we've had to um, translate from post-colonial theory, from Gilroy's diaspora theory and so on, to find the conceptual apparatus that allow us to understand this interactive process non-reductively, which was another theme. So a tradition is always invented. It's not there waiting to be discovered. Locke gave us the tools, but they kind of fell into abeyance. And I think what's exciting now is the way in which they're being redeployed, reactivated in an interactive, or what I'm calling a dialogical methodology. The second point of your question is, is I'm in full agreement, that we are dealing with real content by the 1890s. But rather than a zero-sum relationship with his predecessors, with Lewis and um, Duncanson, which too I agree with you, it, it's much more there's tentative, there's an element of speculation, of improvisation, if you will, in terms of how we read in direction, how we read subtext and allegory. But there was an element in your second part of your question that I think explains why there is this critical difference or signifying difference that we see in the banjo lesson, which is precisely this intramural conflict, these intra-black divisions. And if we step back and think about that in relation to the problem of inauguration, how does a tradition start? How does it get going? We come up with an interesting hypothesis. A distinct tradition starts not from a unitary origin, but from the moment of self-division, which itself is a modernist philosophical premise. That's where Freud starts from. Subjectivity does not begin with a fully formed ego. It begins between the split between um, the ego and the unconscious, the unconscious being that residue, that internal otherness that cannot be fully incorporated, incorporated by rational self-consciousness. So in other words, a tradition doesn't start as a kind of unitary egg that's, that's all there in potentia waiting to sort of develop. It starts with fission, just as cells produce themselves by dividing and dividing and dividing. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. These intramural distinctions that are all around Tanner in the context in which he's, he's doing these two genre um, paintings, and which I believe he, he just, you know, didn't have the personality to, to, to that, I think that was a big part in his decision to leave, this, this very fractious, internally divided uh, scenario of debate. Uh, but if we stand back and theorize, um, we, um, we might come to this hypothesis and then uh, develop it further in relation to the new Negro movement, Harlem Renaissance movement, that a tradition begins in, in self-division. Yeah, thank you for your lecture. I was uh, uh, reminded a little bit of Dutch genre painting and printmaking, especially the theme of um, uh, the prayer before the meal. But thinking back of those images, it's always striking that the domestic realm is a female realm and there's the mother-child interaction and the prayer before the meal in Adrian van der Stad is always a familial, uh, you know, with female presence in there. Could you say a little bit more of what to me was striking this sort of uh, exclusive focus on, on the intergenerational and the sort of male. Um, mm. and, and to what extent he would have looked at some of those in Paris to uh, some of those uh, Dutch genre painting traditions. Right, no, that's really um, intriguing. I think I'm responding to it as um, a really helpful generative observation in the sense that in both works um, the intergenerational relationship is not parent and child it's child and grandparent and I think that three-part relation you know the, the parental generation is as it were implied it's sort of uh, absent from the visual field but nonetheless metonymically present is a way of grappling with um, this question of the discontinuities that characterize 
the lived experience of diaspora. There is um, an evocation of a relationship to the historical period that the grandparent generation uh, uh, went through. I hadn't actually thought about it in terms of the absence of the maternal or an exclusion of the feminine element. Um, so I'll have to think about that a bit more in terms of what that might mean for Tanner's conception of the domestic sphere, for the private sphere. <coughs> yeah. And I mean, just in passing, it's such a marked contrast with Sergeant Johnson much later in 1933, because his Forever Free, his version of Forever Free, is very much the relationship between mother and child. The child is literally inscribed onto the mother's body. One last question. Dr. Mercer, thank you. And I just I would have to say out loud to everyone in public that it's really an honor to have heard you three times in a row and having read your work and been uh, uh, an admirer of yours for as long as I've been a thinking person. Um, and that's not been that long, but it's really an honor <laughs> to hear you uh, in, in person in the flesh. So thank you for that and thank you for three days of this. I really appreciate that. Um, the question I wanted to ask was about resolving a few dichotomies, and I'm going to go from probably the most specific to uh, the little more, a little more general. Um, and it's just sort of putting them out there, and perhaps they're ones that I've created in my mind um, that really aren't ones that you're uh, addressing. But it seemed that in this, both in this lecture and in the, um, the text that I did get to read from the uh, Annotating Art Histories uh, uh, series, that... Um, it's about sort of thinking through uh, certain, amount, certain kinds of dichotomies and recuperating art histories through uh, rethinking certain dichotomies. So the, the first is uh, about painting spirituality, which is just something that's interesting to me, uh, sort of a painting representation of the spiritual and how one goes about that, um, the process of painting the spiritual, how to capture the spiritual in, uh, in, in a material, so capturing the spiritual through some kind of material process. The second is about diaspora and understanding diaspora, and this may be in part the inheritance of, of, of Gilroy, um, but Understanding diaspora not as this, and we go other places um, through the course of your talk you did, but not just as this dichotomy between uh, the U.S. and Europe, so this sort of Euro-American Euro -American as poles of diaspora, but other locations of diaspora and what they mean to uh, rethink in diaspora so that diaspora does not become dichotomized itself and how to sort of uh, recuperate that a bit. The third is a little more, compl is a little more complex just for me to explain, but um, in terms of a hermeneutic structure that you used to, to, to understand both in the, in the series but also in these lectures um, to understand that dichotomy so that if the interpretive language is, is really about language to a certain extent, you rely on uh, semiotics, require a discussion about language, re rely on sort of discourse as metaphor to understand how we can bring these things into conversation uh, literally and figuratively with each other. Um, but that to a certain extent being in contrast to an emphasis on the visual, which you mentioned to me, sort of pushing um, African American studies, pushing uh, a, a conversation about visuality. And if the textual, if the visual then is representative of the ephemeral, uh, of orality so to a certain extent, um, in contrast to the textual and perhaps the more concrete, which is represented in painting, um, how to uh, resolve that dichotomy, even in the interpretive frame? Is there a language of the visual that does not rely on language, if that makes sense? Uh, another kind of way of talking about the visual um, that stays true to a uh, kind of ephemeral form? How does one capture the visual even in its own ephemeracy in something so material? It's like translating orality into text, if that sort of makes sense. And that's sort of a, a dichotomy that, that is a bit complex. But thank you very much. Well, thank you, too. I think the only way I can adequately answer those questions would be if you ask Skip to invite me back to do a seminar. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would take the best part of 10 or 12 weeks to really do justice to these really important questions that you're raising. But given that we have, I don't know, 10 minutes or less rather than 10 weeks, I'll do my best. Um, spirituality is really interesting and important. Um, because this is a uh, universalistic concern. Um, it's there in the uh, luminous techniques of uh, Tanner, uh, the way in which this glow that comes from the hearth, as well as the blue light that's coming in from a window, um, is brought to bear on, on his subjects. 
It's also there in the white marble. I talked yesterday about the way in which there seemed to be an almost possessive attitude on the part of um, Lewis's benefactors with regard to the white marble. But it's very important to simply state that in creating African descended figures in the material of white marble, uh, Lewis as a sculptor was not only imbuing them with dignity, but with a spirituality that was um, very scarce in commonplace depictions of black subjects in the 18, 1860s. So the very fact that it, it wasn't wood, it wasn't bronze, uh, the, the, the specificity of the white marble materials, um, a, along with all the other points that David added yesterday, were, I think, really important um, um, and to that particular work. Um, the point about diaspora, thinking it non-dichotomously as simply a binaristic relationship between the United States and uh, Europe, uh, also <coughs> contains another problem. We tend to think about it in terms of the Anglophone diaspora. We have fantastic work by Brent Hayes Edwards on the Francophone tradition, the practice of diaspora, which really reveals the nodal position of Paris by the time we get to mid-century Afro-modernism. Um, so we have, this, we have a three-way relationship, at least, between African-American artists that form an artist colony in Paris. Um, we have Caribbean um, uh, contributors, M.A. Césaire, and so on, as well as continental Africans themselves, Senghor uh, and others. Um, but the Spanish-speaking or Hispanic dimension is also important. And I think it's really revealing that we're only just now catching up with what, in a sense, we already knew. Um, I've contributed to an exhibition that's opening at Tate Liverpool next year, which is called Afro-Modernism. And the curator's premise was um, specifically to introduce artists from Spanish-speaking regions in Cuba, Brazil, and so on, into a more global understanding of diaspora. Um, even Acorn starts small, you have to start somewhere. And I think it's okay, <laughs> starting with the Atlantic relationship between uh, the United States and, and, and Britain. Um, I don't think that, I think in relation to the other questions that have come up about art history and methodology, um, it's important to think of this project incrementally. It's not something that can happen all at once. I think I'd be rather sus suspect of a, a totalized approach that wanted to sort of plug in all the gaps at one and the same time. Um, but definitely, I mean, if you think of um, Arthur um, Schomburg, you know, and his relationship, um, what's the relationship of Puerto Rico to the Harlem Renaissance? This is something that it's, it's a live issue in the sense that um, we can look back at survey exhibitions of Harlem and see how recently it is that the Black Atlantic thesis has introduced Caribbean artists like um, Edna uh, Manley and Ronald Moody um, into the picture. But how much work we've yet to do in terms of thinking about Francophone, Hispanic, as well as Anglophone uh, dimensions of travel. Um, and then the third point about visuality, uh, I suppose it's a reflection of my own formation. Um, I mean, for me, Bakhtin and the Russian formalists uh, sort of really what I cut my eye teeth on, as well as Roland Barthes. And there are those who um, have issues with the risk or the threat of linguistic reductionism. And I think in certain artistic traditions and contexts, those arguments have led to, let's say, uh, a turn towards phenomenology, um, which you know, have their own cost. I mean, the, the benefits and costs in, in, in all cases. For me, the linguistic model, the reason why I think the dialogic model is valuable is because it can counteract the worst excesses of the focus either on biography or identity, sort of identity-driven analysis of um, diasporic art, or the kind of contextualist view that art is simply a reflection of the times in which it was created. I'm really interested in what Vofflin called the action of picture upon picture, what Barth called an intertextuality. I think the, and as uh, Skip Gates has shown, this is how signifying differences make a difference. And I'm not convinced that we know enough yet 
about how formations that were previously seen as simply being minor, of minority interest, how far those um, we understand the formal stylistic and iconographic choices uh, that, that, that deliver those differences. So I think before we can get to orality, performativity, or ephemerality, again, we, the option might be to slow down and to uh, think about the aesthetic ontology of the, the art object itself. Let's give another round of applause. Well, thank you. <laughs>